Ms. French? Here. Mr. Prethert? Here. Ms. Ragu? Here. Mr. Bracken? Here. Mr. Ellerby? Here. Ms. Franklin? Here. Mayor Snavely? Here. If you would care to join us, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I would now entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any changes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And now we move to public comments. Uh, anyone wishing to address council on items that are not on the agenda, or if, they, if it's something on the consent agenda, this would be the time to come forward, give us your name and where you live, and we'll give you five minutes. Seeing no one hop up, uh, I will assume there are no public comments. If you want to comment on something that's on the agenda, we'll recognize you at that time. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any items that need to be removed? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Consent agenda is approved. And we'll move then to resolutions, and you can read the first one. A resolution authorizing the city manager to apply for the 2022 Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response Grants Program. Okay, is there a motion to adopt? So made. Second. And it's seconded. Thank you, David. Um, who's going to talk about it? You are? Okay, Doug. Well, so the City of Oxford Division of Fire and EMS has experienced a growing increase in the number of calls for service from 2,347 in 2009 to 3,206 in 2022. That's a 37% increase. During this time period, uh, we've gone from part-time department to a full-time department. And currently we're staffed with nine full-time firefighter paramedics, three per shift. And they're also supplemented with part-time employees on Thursday through Saturday. So the city was recently notified of a funding opportunity to add additional staffing in our fire EMS division. The funding program is entitled Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response Grants Program, SAFER, and it is administered by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The application deadline is March 17, 2023. The program was created to provide funding directly to fire departments to help them increase or maintain the number of trained frontline firefighters available in their communities. Sure. The goal of SAFER is to enhance local fire departments' ability to comply with staffing, response, and operational standards established by the NFPA. So I'm requesting that Council authorize the City Manager to apply for a Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response Grant in the amount of $950,000 to hire six additional firefighter paramedics. There is no match for this grant. Uh, if we are successful in obtaining this funding, the city then will hire six additional firefighter paramedics once we're notified. Uh, this funding, of course, will only cover one year of expense, and the city will need to consider placing on the ballot, most likely in November 2023, a second income tax increase or property tax levy to provide long-term funding for this additional staffing. And I'd be glad to answer any questions you have about the Okay, thank you. Opportunity. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Councilors, any comments or questions? I have a question, which is, do the funds need to be expended within one year? Would it be possible to hire three firefighters over two years with the same amount of money? You know, how much flexibility? Do I think we have some program? flexibility, and of course it's going to take us some time. Uh, you know, there are a lot of departments adding staff. So we, we believe we have some flexibility. And Jessica, if you want to add something to that. To answer your question, um, you could you have three years in which to use the funds in case it's hard to recruit and takes you a while to find your staff members. Um, but what you could not do is pay for three for two years. So once you hire someone 
that's like a new hire and it's meant for new hires and so that's like an incremental um, step um, and so but you have three years to, to hire all six does that answer your question yeah, I just yeah. the idea if we spent all that money in one year and then we didn't have the funds, like you would hate to recruit the people and not have the funds in the back end. So I'd rather like if you could phase into it. They give you like a year for okay. recruitment, a year for hiring, and then a year for like finishing up and reporting. But then they give you a lot of flexibility in that, you know, um, as far as you want to move faster or slower, you know. Okay. But that's generally how it was built to work. Great, thank you. And we'll give them time for training. Exactly. Okay. Vote. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted. We'll move to item B. A resolution to collaborate with the Butler County Regional Transit Authority to apply for the Federal Transit Administration 2023 Competitive Funding Opportunity Areas of Persistent Poverty Grant Program and commit a 10% match up to $20,000. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. And seconded. Jessica, welcome. Good evening. So this is a, a partnership grant and we learned about this. Thank you, Jeff Robinson. He actually sent me an email and said, did you know that we are classified as an area of persistent poverty under the Federal Transit Administration? And I said, no, I did not. Um, and so then I looked at this grant and it is a planning grant um, and it is really geared toward public transportation. Um, but they have, so I called Matt Dukovich from Butler County Regional Transit Authority and I said, are you gonna be looking at this grant? And he said, I am. And he said, would you like to partner? And I said, I would. <laughs> and so um, the three cities that are partnering are, uh, if, if you approve, would be Oxford, Hamilton, and Middletown. And this grant also has a call out for decreasing carbon emissions and climate sustainability as a huge scoring component. And so one of the allowable criteria for public transit planning is to partner with other modes of transportation and then expand pedestrian and bicycle access to public transportation facilities. And so what we are proposing to do is that we would do, if awarded, a planning grant that would finish up the planning of the entire northwest segment of the Oxford area trail. And then also all of what um, Councilor Prithrich calls the spokes, um, which would be determining where good connections from the trail to what I call um, business centers or employment corridors. What are those interior connections? What route should they be? And what's nice about this grant is it's not just the route planning, but it takes you through the initial engineering feasibility and what's called your NEPA review, which is your environmental review. Right now when we get a grant for like our trail, we get, um, you know, we have the alignment already, but we have to pay for all of that route um, engineering and the NEPA on our own. And then the grant helps us with construction. So we would cover with this grant that middle bit that right now we're doing out of pocket um, if awarded. So there is a 20%, excuse me, 10% match. And so we um, are saying that up to $20,000 would be our required match for this. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Okay, counselors? Any questions or comments? I think I think we're all thinking yeah. this is a good thing. And I love the emphasis on on the thirty percent design. If that's what you're doing, which is like we've got lots of plans with dotted lines. What we need is thirty percent design in order to go for grants. So so that's what this could really help us with. So fingers it, crossed. It takes you further than that. It takes you up to ready for construction. Okay. Well, which is excellent. Even better. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Well, I also think it's important to recognize that even though Oxford has this reputation of being a place with the university and with a certain amount of wealth, the fact that it's designated an area of persistent poverty um, connects with some of the conversations we've been having the last couple of council meetings. So I appreciate um, Acting Chief Robinson for bringing that up. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion? Ready to vote? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted. We'll move to C. A resolution accepting the bid and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with M&A Coatings LLC for maintenance of a water storage reservoir 
at a cost of $245,300, staff request an allowance of $25,000 for the replacement of existing structural materials if necessary, plus a contingency in the amount of $24,530 for a total cost not to exceed $294,830. Okay, is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. And Michael, Good evening, Your Honor, members of Council. Uh, we last recoded this tank about 22 years ago, so this coating is ending the, uh, the period of its useful life. So it's uh, much cheaper to uh, take care of things than to tear them down and build new ones. So uh, we advertised our uh, specifications. We received seven bids for the project. Uh, we were forced to disqualify one bid. Uh, they had uh, numerous errors and were definitely not the best bid. Uh, so we are recommending M&A Coatings LLC as the lowest and best bid. And uh, we've not done work with them previously, but have checked their references and they're all uh, excellent references. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. I seem to remember the last time we did that. Deja vu. All over <laughs> all again. Over again. <laughs> Is there anyone from the public? I'm only going to do it one more time. <laughs> I'm not going to be around for that one. Is there anybody from the public who'd like to address this resolution? Okay, counselors, do you have any questions? Okay. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 The resolution is adopted. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. And we'll go to number D. <laughs> a resolution accepting the bid and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Sunessis Construction Company for construction of the Oxford Area Trail System Phases 3 and 4 at a cost of $4,490,575 plus a contingency in the amount of 10% the contract price or $449,057.50 for a total cost not to exceed $4,939,632.50. <laughs> and is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Thank you very much. Mike? So first, that's a, that's a huge number. We're yes, building a little over four miles of trail. Uh, the good news is Jessica's done an excellent job of fundraising for this. Uh, she's raised over three million of this four million dollar contract. So uh, we're only using about 68 percent, uh, or strike that. We have grant funding for 68 percent of the project. So uh, that is going to uh, allow our levy funds to to go much further and be leveraged again in the future for future phases. Uh, so that being said, phase three uh, is split into two segments, and it is going to connect uh, Bonham Road and Leonard Hill Park with uh, Ohio State Route 73, and it's already constructed to go under 73, uh, so there will be a good connection all the way to 27, and there will also be a connector from Heifer Park uh, at US 27 uh, up to Talawanda High School. Phase four is also being funded, and that is going to connect uh, Alawanda Middle School on State Route 732 with the Oxford Community Park. And the original plan was to connect at uh, K Ranch Drive. Uh, with the development of Owl's Landing, uh, we have some cost-saving opportunities, and we're able to cut through the development and make a connection with the community park. Uh, there's a little tiny piece that uh, uh, we'll need to build locally, and that's uh, another resolution tonight. Uh, we advertise this project, and it is a bit concerning. We only received two bids for the project. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, uh, the lowest bid was uh, right at our estimate, so we're confident that the price is valid and good. But uh, uh, contractors are busy, and the plethora of federal funds out there uh, contractors can be more choosy and choose uh, their, their more profitable projects. Uh, so we're pleased that uh, we have the two bids. Uh, we do have experience with Sunesis. Uh, they built phase two for the city. Uh, we have a great relationship with them and expect this will go smoothly for phases three and four. Okay. 
be glad to answer questions. Okay, is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Okay, councilors, besides saying yay, is there anything else? We have concerns or questions? I have a question about timing, which is all of this is happening in the context of big changes with our school districts that are going to remove some busing for those students who are local. So thinking about the timing, particularly of four, which it's an approach to the middle school, do you have a sense of when that project is going to, because it A, involves the creation of a new trail, but it also involves removal of an existing sidewalk. So the school year starts in mid-August. Where are we going to be with all of this mm -hmm. before that? So I don't have an official schedule because we don't have a contract with this company yet. That'll be job one to get a schedule. Job two will be to beat the uh, bat deadline so that we can remove trees uh, before the March 31st deadline. Okay. So we're already uh, up against that. Uh, our, uh, this has taken longer to get to this point than we expected. And so that's disappointing. But uh, we're here now and looking forward to, to move. Yeah, I'm super excited. I just, uh, we may have to have some kind of like construction progress mitigation. I don't know what that would even look like, but I think we're going to have a lot more kids walking and biking to our schools. Well, I think especially the next part fall. to, uh, from Dana Drive up to the middle school is kind of the key portion. And so if that can be scheduled a little yeah, bit earlier. Prioritize. There, there is a note in the plans and I don't remember verbatim, yeah. uh, but it does address the issue. Okay. And uh, there should always be a pathway uh, may not always be paved or uh, wheelchair accessible, but there should be always a, a pathway for short periods of time while the uh, demo gets completed and the new trail gets put in place. All right, thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The resolution is adopted and we'll move to the next. A resolution accepting the bid and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Majors Enterprises Incorporated for construction of the Oxford Community Park Trail Connection to the Oxford Area Trail System Phase 4 at a cost of $142,921.36 plus the contingency in the amount of 10% of the contract price or $14,292 for a cost not to exceed $157,213.36. Okay, is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. This is the uh, small connector piece that's going to connect uh, Owl's Landing to the south of the, of the aerial here, uh, mm -hmm. up to the pathway that's already built at the community park, uh, just southwest of the aquatic center. So we did receive three bids for this. Uh, and ironically, Sinesis, who won the first contract for uh, $4.4 million or whatever it was, uh, was not the low bidder for this little segment. So uh, Majors Enterprises was the lowest and best bidder. Uh, they have great references, and uh, we look forward to working with them and recommend your approval for that. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Okay. Councilors? Nope. Okay. Ready to vote. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. We're looking forward to these projects. Read the next one. A resolution accepting the proposal and authorizing the city manager to enter into a professional services project agreement with Bear Becker Incorporated for the design and engineering of the Oxford Area Trail System Phase 5 at a cost of $725,000 um, $725,604 plus a contingency in the amount of $72,560 for a total cost not to exceed $798,164. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. And Michael, you're up again. Uh, phase five is going to be a uh, technically challenging segment of the trail to build. Uh, ultimately, it's going to connect the uh, Talawanda High School uh, with Talawanda Middle School in Phase 4. Uh, one of the large obstacles we will face is the railroad and uh, identify how to go over or under that and 
all the pros and cons that go with that. Uh, one of the factors that we used to evaluate uh, submitting firms was their experience with uh, the railroads. And uh, our recommendation to you is using Bear Becker, uh, who has experience and we're very comfortable working with them and they've always delivered uh, on time for us. So uh, ultimately, jumping ahead of myself here, uh, we did have a committee of uh, the assistant city manager and community development director, city engineer, and myself. Uh, we ranked the two firms that submitted. Uh, Bear Becker uh, was the, the highest scoring candidate, so we're recommending you approve this design contract with Bear Becker for the development of phase five of the Oak Strip. Very much. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Okay, so this is, as opposed to the others, this is planning. So we're trying to get the, the plan done for the really difficult number five. Any questions or comments? So I, I should give council a heads up. Uh, uh, we received uh, firm pricing from Bear Becker. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, ODOT has changed the rules on. Uh, some of the borings that are required for the project. Uh, so our costs are going to go up a little bit. Uh, we're going to have to increase the number of borings we do along the trail to identify the geology of the trail. Uh, we'll, we will eat that in the contingency, uh, but I want to alert you that uh, the rules change and costs change, and I just want to make sure you're aware. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. All those in favor of the resolution indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution is adopted. And looks like we got another one. Two more. <laughs> A resolution accepting the bid and authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Barrett <coughs> Paving Materials Incorporated for the 2023 street resurfacing and maintenance program at a cost of $453,697.52 with alternative number one costing $49,490 plus a contingency in the amount of $16,812.48 for a total cost not to exceed $520,000. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael? Right. <clears throat> Most of the work in this year's program is in the uh, Tollgate, Anderson, Erickson, Stonehenge area, and uh, a few segments on Beach and Collins streets. So the city uh, advertised for bids. Uh, we received four bids. The uh, apparent low bidder, uh, unfortunately, was not pre-qualified by ODOT, which is a requirement to be a bidder in the city of Oxford. Uh, so that bid uh, we're recommending be disallowed, making Barrett Paving the lowest and best bid. So and they have done this before? Yes, before. we've worked with them numerous years, never a problem. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Okay. I would just like to point out to the public that this is something that the city is able to do every year, that we take some of the worst streets every year and we make them better. And so it's ongoing process that we go through and that your tax dollars go towards. Well, I would just also express thanks because this is a collaborative project between the city and taxpayer funded dollars and the adjacent homeowners who are assessed for the costs to do the curb and gutter and the sidewalk, which is their legal responsibility, but ultimately it's a team effort. I know that the costs on everything have gone up for the city and for the homeowners. And so what were already high costs or even higher costs now. Um, and so for those folks who are having to bear those costs. I mean, again, it's a legal responsibility, but whenever you have to do it, it's a lot, just like it's a lot for the city to have to budget half a million dollars. Um, so just expressing thanks to those people for what is effectively a partnership with the city to improve the streets in front of their houses. Yeah, last year, our, our costs were up 32%, which is a, a huge jump. Uh, this year, they've stabilized and are more in line with infl uh, typical inflation. But uh, yeah, the prices keep going up. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Okay. Um, did I already ask that? I think I may have. Anyway. 
thank you all. <laughs> um, are you ready to vote? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Resolution is adopted. Now, Michael, the last one. Go ahead and read it. <laughs> A resolution declaring that it is necessary to improve those portions of certain properties shown on Exhibit A attached hereto in the city of Oxford, Ohio, by repaving, recurbing, and repairing the sidewalks, curbs, and gutters. Okay. Can I have a motion to adopt? Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. This is, this is the first of four pieces of legislation needed for this program. Uh, we'll follow Ohio Revised Code Section 729. Uh, this is the first step where there's a resolution of necessity. Uh, our engineering division has uh, identified uh, curb gutter and sidewalk sections that are uh, deficient to our standards. Uh, we've already sent a courtesy notice to homeowners or property owners, uh, uh, trying to give them a, a jump on the process. Uh, but if you pass this resolution today, that will be the official notice and we will send uh, certified letters to uh, each property owner involved. Uh, subsequent to that, property owners uh, may make the repairs themselves or with their uh, qualified contractor. Uh, if they choose not to do so, uh, we will let a contract and have the work performed for them. Uh, we will come back to the city council with the resolution of actual costs and then ultimately there will be a levying uh, ordinance uh, that will assess the cost to their tax bill. I'm glad to answer any questions. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? I have one question for you. Do you have an idea about whether for a homeowner it is less expensive if they get their own contractor or is it less expensive if they have the city do it? It is generally less expensive for the property owner to do the work themselves, especially if they can partner with some of their neighbors and get some economy of scale. Mm -hmm. While the city will have economy of scale, we also have wow. the bureaucracy of prevailing wages and things that uh, will escalate the price. So okay. uh, generally it's cheaper to uh, do it yourself under your own terms. Thank you. That will answer a question that I got today. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I guess I would just ask a question for the public because this was raised on Facebook. I mean, people say, well, why doesn't the city just, you know, use tax dollars to do the sidewalks? So I think I look at these numbers here and I see why we, you know, so can you just answer the question for the, the, for the person who, why, yeah, so why do we need to assess people? It, it is done in uh, different ways in different municipalities. This, this practice has been in place for decades where the property owner is responsible for their curb gutter and sidewalk. Uh, some communities, they'll, they'll lump in the, the repairs with the construction project. Uh, if we did that, we would be building uh, probably only a quarter of what we would be able to uh, resurface. Uh, so in a, you know, to change paths now, which which I would applaud because it's a tremendous amount of work for us to, to do it this way. Um, uh, would not be very fair to uh, prior uh, prior years participants in the program. Thank you. Yeah, and if, you know, as Mike said, and, and that was David's point, if you look at what we have budgeted for doing the streets, we would have to reduce it back by 150,000, about a third of what we plan to do. So uh, yeah. that's that's the main reason basically thank you doug are you ready to vote oh, i yes. had something and then i think jason has something right. as well right. uh i wanted to address the what david pointed out earlier the increase in students who will be walking to school in light of the changes with talawanda and we received an email that asked what can the city do about the sidewalks and i just wanted to highlight that this is what we do about the sidewalks so it's you know the sidewalks do get updated but the onus is on the property owner not the city to make those changes so, jason i just had a general philosophical point sorry <laughs> <laughs> i have a philosophy background so it's hard for me not to trust so i agree that it might be i'm not even about this specifically but anytime there's something that could be made better but would then seem unfair to those who previously addressed it if you always hold that off you never improve 
Mm. Uh, it may not be applicable here because we already have a system in place, lots of other things, but some to consider. Okay. I, I would say where we varied for that, from that philosophy is where there was never a sidewalk in place, the city has constructed miles and miles of brand new sidewalks and not charged the property owners whatsoever. Uh, ultimately, in 40 years, when, when those sidewalks will need repairs, uh, the property owner, I assume, will be on the hook. But uh, 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 Just last year, we did a new sidewalk to uh, Kramer Elementary on North Locust, and uh, there were no costs involved for the property owners. Yeah, and again, that wasn't specifically about this. It was just, if there's a better way to do things, as a government, as a society, we have to find ways to transition to doing that and not always worry about who might be hurt in the instantaneous versus the long term. Okay, so you ready to vote? Yep, <laughs> that's a good point to make. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted and we'll move to ordinances first reading. An ordinance amending ordinance number 3697, supplemental budget ordinance number two, to make supplemental appropriations for fiscal year 2023. Thank you. And Joe, lead us through it. Okay, there's just two uh, items on this. Uh, the first one is to make an adjustment to budgeted revenue for the uh, ARPA funds that we're getting from the county for a social service agency. And that's 1.5 million and then on the expense side would be 1.5 million to forward those funds to whatever agency that is deemed who receives them and the next one is just we got our final uh, revenue from the Oxford Cemetery Association it was an additional ninety nine thousand one hundred eighteen dollars and fifty eight cents so that's just showing net revenue going into the general fund okay. and that's it is there anyone from the public who wants to address this ordinance? Uh, Mike, I have a question for you, Joe. Um, we are hoping that the commissioners in their wisdom will provide more than the 1.5. Uh, if that happens, we'll just make it another We'll just make another one. Yeah, I just wanted to get this and just... Yeah, I just that, didn't want to so get the money. Signal. I don't want to hold them up for right. a month. I just didn't want to send the wrong signal to the people who were involved in, in those two organizations. Right. I'm just going with what the original proposal understands. It. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments? This will come up for second reading at our next meeting. Uh, you can read the second. An ordinance accepting the recommendation of the Planning Commission to remove the plan development designation and approve a new preliminary subdivision for Heron Pond located along Kerr Road in the city of Oxford with conditions. Okay, thank you, Sam, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. A couple of Planning Commission recommendations for you tonight. This, uh, this particular property on Kerr Road has been in front of you uh, a few times before, so this is a revision to the previous approved plan. It's actually a new application, and the way we worded the ordinance, instead of having to do two steps, was to remove the plan development previous approval and, and uh, accept the recommendation for a preliminary from Planning Commission. So. Uh, the, the difference with this is instead of 15 uh, kind of internally focused lots uh, with a private street, this would be more of a traditional uh, development. So it's a, a subdivision instead. So this would come back for final as well, but this is a preliminary. Uh, so there would be access from the exterior of the site instead of the interior. Uh, we had some good collaboration with uh, the applicant, Bear Becker Engineers, and the owner uh, on their behalf uh, to make some revisions to it. And so we're at a good place now uh, to uh, bring forward that recommendation. One of the changes was to remove one of the development lots so that the ownership could stay with the church for the driveway because it would have been kind of difficult for that to happen, uh, to access off a private driveway. They agreed to that. Um, and then there was some coordination and wordsmithing uh, with the uh, completion of the sidewalks and bike paths. So that has all been completed and is in the ordinance in front of you tonight. Um, and I think that pretty much takes care of it. Had some good, uh, good input from uh, surrounding property owners as well. And so happy to answer any questions. Okay, so there's anyone from the petitioner who would like to address this initially? Good evening, uh, City Council. My name is John Baer with Baer Becker. 
uh, 110 South College Avenue. Um, here on behalf of the applicant, each PCT Properties and Shane Kaufman. I uh, don't have anything to add to Sam's presentation. Uh, Sam said we had a lot of back and forth collaboration both with, both with staff um, and with Planning Commission and we're uh, happy with the conditions as proposed but uh, are here for any questions you have. Can you, before we go to the public, just tell, briefly give us the why there's a change? That, that part wasn't um, communicated. From the original proposal yeah, why, that came before why you? Are we changing it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the original proposal that um, uh, for this property that came before um, was a planned development with a street that stretched through the middle of this property and had small lots on either side of it um, to create um, a large number of home sites. Uh, and as the developer worked through the process of getting the city approvals for construction um, and the bonding in place and getting to begin those um, construction activities, it was determined that through the cost increases of materials and construction over the past uh, three or four years that have been uh, rampant, it was determined that the cost of construction was too high to make the project feasible. Uh, so this proposal before you, um, without that center internal road, uh, reduces the, the development costs and allows uh, for constructability uh, with, without the increased cost. So the, when the consumer eventually buys a house on one of these lots, it's going to be less expensive. Is that what you would uh, Then if they had a road down the middle, like the, in the first one? I would say more so the the first one that came before you wasn't economically feasible to where the the price of the lots would not be sold um, if that makes sense in order to make the development work the, the lot prices would be too high okay um, so now it's an economically feasible situation all right thank you yep is there anyone from the public who would like to address this Michael come on up Good evening, Mayor and members of City Council and members of City Staff. My name is Mike Rudolph. I live at 200 Morgan Circle in South Farm Homeowners, uh, South Farm Subdivision out there. And I'm representing tonight as the president of the South Farm Homeowners Association, all of our homeowners that live in there. Um, we are very happy to come again before City Council as we did before planning uh, in favor of this change of the way the subdivision will look. We feel that it will fit more in line with what we have out there right now with South Farm, uh, much more conventional. We like the design going from 15 to 8 that we have uh, currently in this proposal. Uh, it does, as both Sam and Zach put in the staff report, it appears more conventional uh, in the way that it will look. Um, we also, I've heard the word collaboration used an awful lot tonight. Uh, this, as it's come before you many times, we've had a lot of collaboration with the uh, developer, with Baron Becker um, as a homeowners association. We really appreciate Sam and Zach including us in this. We think this is going to be one of the nicest designs that could be put before you. So uh, again, I'm here in all uh, favor of this and uh, hope that you all are too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address anyone else from the public who would like to address this? Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, Councilors, any discussion, questions? Just one informational question. Uh, the pond that's behind this subdivision, uh, <coughs> is there any plans to do anything around that pond as sort of like a barrier from the individuals that may own that particular land? Not that I'm aware of, no, okay. no, no just, fencing. I just know that that pond gets a lot of use in the, uh, when it's warmer and I was wondering if there may be any issues with uh, people that are not the owners of those properties being upset regarding individuals being in their backyard, so to speak. Good question. All right. I'm going to recognize Mike Rudolph because I think he wants to address that question. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you very much. I'd like to address Glenn's question there because that's a very good one. That has been one of the issues that our Homeowners Association has had to deal with now since the early 1990s when our subdivision was actually put in place. Um, we have a series of rules out there that do allow certain people, whether they're homeowners or guests, to come out there and fish in the pond and use it. Um, it is a retention pond for the subdivision, but we also want to open it up to the public because it is stocked fully 
Boystock. We have a great relationship with Cobblestone Community Church out there where any number of groups of people can come out and use the pond. And to Glenn's point, is it safe? Should we have fencing up there? We've found over the years that it's pretty well self-policed. Uh, we have put multiple signs out there with lights on the top of the signs, uh, with rings, safe, uh, safety rings, as well as lots of line. So we feel very strongly that it is a pretty safe environment out there. We've also counseled with our um, insurance providers, uh, Faye Bruder, here in town about any liability issues that we have, and they feel like we're pretty well protected out there. So it's a good question, Glenn, but I think we're dealing with that as a homeowners group. And the nice part about this change in the plan of this is that these new eight homes will be a part of South Farm Homeowners Association. There's not a need for a completely separate HOA out there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for letting me address Thank that. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any other questions? I guess I would make the point that there was some wrestling in the planning commission because it's, at one level it's like, is this really a subdivision? This is kind of lot splits. And I think that some of us have been this long enough, we just adopted a comprehensive plan that kind of envisioned a more compact, traditional neighborhood development. I was just looking at our new compact, comprehensive plan. This is supposed to be urban neighborhood, as I understand, traditional neighborhood. But this just shows the kind of the disjuncture between what you say you want to do, which is optimize your land, get good densities, get walkability. But our current zoning, it's R2, right, you know, and, and, oh, and our subdivision code permit gives them the right to develop. And so I think the Planning Commission wrestled with the idea, this is not really the development pattern that we would like to see our land used in, I think, but the reality is they have a right under um, this is conventional, low to medium density suburban, which is the way our corridors have developed. So it's not, it's the way Fairfield it's developed, and, you know. It's, but, but I think it just, I'm just making the point that like, we just adopted a comprehensive plan, but this is why we're going to have to revise our zoning code if we want outcomes that are substantially different from the conventional outcome, um, and which is I think what we'll be doing next year, right? Yeah, I think if the if the property was slightly larger, it would have been a little bit easier to, yeah, to was, do more of a yeah. traditional urban neighborhood. And I understand we yeah. would yeah. like to see the housing, but it, it yeah, it, it's a little object lesson. Um, but good point. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for the uh, public, this again is first reading, so it'll come back to us at our next meeting. And we can move to second readings. No, um, my first go reading. ahead and read it. And then I, I will entertain a motion to take hold. We still have one more first reading. Oh, did I miss yeah. one? Oh, I sure did. Okay. Read that. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I was rushing ahead there. <laughs> An ordinance approving a conditional use permit application to allow for the establishment of a restaurant use exceeding the Oxford Zoning Code's maximum parking limit at 5000 College Corner Pike, Oxford, Ohio, 45056 with conditions. I apologize for waffling on that. <laughs> Go ahead, Sam. Thank you. Another planning commission recommendation uh, for this one is actually conditional use to exceed the maximum parking uh, requirements. So there, that is why this got on the agenda. It's not what you may have recalled from previous uh, restaurants where there'd be a drive-through or uh, some type of a gas station type of use where there's a conditional use uh, request for the use itself. This is a permitted conditional use where the uh, issue was really about the, just the parking. And that was an amendment made to the code in 2014 uh, to kind of control the uh, excessive parking expansion that had gone on uh, developed uh, prior to that date. Uh, so the request was to have five additional parking spaces, to have 23 instead of 18. And, and because of the conditional use uh, request, there's an option to request waivers within that. So the additional request was to have an additional wall sign as well. So that's why this was being requested. So that triggers the uh, mm -hmm. notification and uh, opportunity for hearing. And the Planning Commission did hear comments and received some written comments as well, which was reflected within the recommendation and review. Uh, and those had to do with uh, screening, fencing, security, those types of things. Uh, Planning Commission also discussed at length uh, the maneuverability of the parking lot. It's a, as we discussed with the previous case, properties that are already platted are sometimes difficult to work with, and this was one of those. Uh, Waffle House's engineer uh, and consultant did a good job of working with us on some of those challenges. 
Uh, there was an additional walkway added, which was a recommendation of ours as well. Uh, they decided that they wanted to also have the ADA accessible uh, walkway, so there's actually two walkways. So the plans have been revised consistent with the recommendations, and the recommendations still stayed in the ordinance just to make double sure uh, that it's all in there. Uh, so with that, um, I can answer any questions. It was a fairly complex, thorough process, um, but I can answer any details that you might have. So before we go to the public, the, the issue before us is the expansion of parking front. Five additional parking spaces. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So for the public's information, we don't choose tenants. We don't choose which restaurants come to town. So that's why it's not a Panera. Only those who read Oxford talk would get the humor in that. But um, is there anyone from the public who would like to address this? Okay. Um, hearing none, any comments from council? Yeah, I know there are some concerns. I'm wondering if our interim chief could speak to that about traffic and pedestrian congestion in that area from some of our community members. So we've we've spoken with uh, the community development department uh, during their planning for this, and one of the concerns was obviously high traffic uh, Friday mornings. Saturday morning, Sunday mornings, uh, how that's going to affect neighboring businesses uh, and such. And I think uh, some of the discussions we had were the additional parking. I believe uh, they also had some uh, fencing that has been approved uh, to go up to help with some of the lighting and, and protecting the neighborhood from some of the, the light traffic or noise traffic that's, that's going to be behind the property. Uh, but this is something we look at with community development on a number of properties in town. Uh, we do keep an eye on uh, several locations that tend to have busy drive-throughs that end up stacking out onto main roadways. Uh, and so we do constantly monitor that and we're constantly meeting and talking about those problems as they do come up and as they get reported. So we're aware of it and uh, we'll keep an eye on it just like we do with, with others in town. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I want to just recognize the various people who have reached out to the city about this. I mean, some people have reached out kind of about the nature of the business, but that's not really the choice here. The more relevant ones were the people who I think are easy to sympathize with. It's those people who live in the Northwest Mile Square, who, which is the one stable or occupied portion of the Mile Square, um, which also happens to be adjacent to our general business district. Um, and, and the nature of our zoning is that, you know, the general business district is a relatively our code is relatively permissive and it's kind of auto oriented and so and that's the nature of American commerce in the 21st century I mean I'm personally grateful this doesn't have a drive-through like I consider that in 2023 a win um, <laughs> it will have less queuing you know and all that yep. stuff and and so I think there's mixed feeling in the community about but like I know my teenagers really excited about Waffle House um, <laughs> as I think a lot of people are but I, I you know I think that it's really tricky I'm really sympathetic to those people who comment and contacted us, a uh, number of neighbors, particularly on West Vine, who, you know, this is currently a grassy lot and, and is, is, will be developed as a commercial business. And again, the nature of 21st century commercial is it's, it's not your neighborhood bodega. It's, it will have traffic and it will have dumpsters and it will have lights and, and it, will, it will have 24 hour a day commerce and I think rightfully you one can sympathize um, I mean this is why we end up seg with segregations of uses in our zoning because we're, we might not want those things right adjacent to us um, but you know so I, I really sympathize with those things but uh, coming down to it again is is that it is zone general business uh, the only reason this isn't a buy right development is because they want to exceed with the parking and when we've set some limits there but if, if you know it's, people say, well, if it's too small of a lot, like, yeah, it's really, I mean, it's, it's not too small of a lot for what they want to do. They, if they didn't want the extra parking, it wouldn't be here in front of us. Um, they have a right to do this. We don't pick the businesses. Um, you know, I'm grateful that this is a sit-down restaurant that won't have drive through queuing, um, that won't have a speaker blaring. Uh, and, and
and, and, and we got the screening in the and, 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 and I really do commend community development staff and the applicant for thinking about how best one can screen this to make it as good of a neighbor as it can be to the people there. I mean, you know, again, it, it doesn't change the view out their window. I mean, like, it will change the view. Like, whatever we do is not going to make this not a, a Waffle House restaurant. Um, but I really appreciate within the purview that we have and within the property rights that they have that, that, that this is a pretty good solution um, for this. Um, and, and I just hope that the operators of this will continue to work because things change. Like, are there going to be Grubhub drivers? And what about lights? And like, you know, so there will be ongoing operations of this that, you know, I look forward to collaboration to address issues. So if neighbors have issues about its operation, you know, then that's a separate thing. So um, anyway, I just want to express my, my sympathies with those folks and understanding why they have those concerns, but why ultimately, you know, I'm probably going gonna, gonna to vote to approve this in second reading. So. Thank you, Dave. Is there anybody else? Well, uh, I was curious about parking for truckers. If truckers are coming through, where would they typically park that area? Do you want to address it? Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Walter Barano and I'm with Waffle House. Um, I understand your question. Um, we do have a lot of uh, uh, restaurants that, that cater to um, the trucking community, but they're located in areas where you do have that community. Um, we don't anticipate this being that, that kind of area. Uh, we anticipate this being, uh, you know, after baseball practice and um, on your way to work in the morning and those types of things and so for that reason there's really not in our opinion a necessity for that type of thing okay yeah and I was asking more for the parking specifically I when I think about trucking I realize there's probably nothing in my fridge or my cabinet that wasn't brought into town by someone who drives a truck you know <laughs> yeah. they need to eat too but I understand your argument that um, that probably isn't the, the the clientele that we would serve just because of the location primarily correct yes ma'am is it possible and I'm, i'll ask whoever wants to answer is it possible to have a sign there that would restrict large trucks yeah. from parking there because i i think that could bollocks up the whole thing if if you had a couple of semis who decided to stop there and if you had a sign that said no trucks um it might be we will have deliveries um yeah, which is fine <laughs> Um, I, or I don't customer see why not. I don't, I don't, I don't anticipate, I guess I don't yeah, I see many no truck signs, but, um, I'm sure we can come up with one. <laughs> I bet you can. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think oh, that could I, be in the things that we monitor. With okay. Yeah. That, that would be a good thing to look at. I also have a question, uh, related to parking. Do we anticipate having to whether it's OPD or more signage around people part using the adjacent parking for the other businesses as overflow which we would I don't think want them to do if it's if it's off peak hours for those businesses and those businesses are okay with it I don't expect there to be any problem okay. with that a lot of um, property owners and business owners will obtain some type of cross access easement to legalize that use for the overflow parking and I'm sure that would be a good problem for Waffle House to have, um, but where they could uh, they could put up signs that would say, you know, if you're not a, a customer of Coldwell Bank or Curse CPA, then you're going to be towed, and the police okay. department can enforce that too. Okay. So. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. what, go ahead. With the different tactics you're using to mitigate against the sound and the light that are going to be affecting the nearby neighbors. Do you feel that it would affect them very much or will there be additional light that is coming through their windows or how noisy will it be for them? We, there wasn't a noise study on its own done. Uh, there was a very specific request, if you saw in the ordinance for a board and batten fence, which allows for, it, it prevents the light and the sound from traveling through the gaps in the boards. Uh, so that was that was kind of a special request. The lighting is all down lighting, uh, so there's not the floodlights that some of the actually surrounding property owners that are farther away are probably more obtrusive than this adjacent business would be. Uh, so there's no way to predict all of those things. Um, there are sound 
regulations, even if this business wasn't here, that are enforceable and, and those can be measured. Uh, so that could be something to Council Perthridge's point, operationally can be monitored uh, and based on complaints and follow up. So so I, I don't know, uh, we'll see. Uh, but I think substantial effort has been made to minimize it to the greatest extent possible. And is there shrubbery that can? Be there's some okay. landscaping, okay. yeah. Okay. All right. mm -hmm. Yep. I, yeah. There's some there's some trees that are shown in there, and, and the the cemetery, and there's some existing trees already in the area that are being retained. And uh, uh, Zachary Moore, our city planners, work closely with the city en engineer's office too to try to. There's a sanitary sewer line that goes through there, so trying to protect the sewer line while also allowing screening and trees and all those things is, is a lot to try to coordinate, so. Mm -hmm. When I first moved, moved here, that was Fry Avenue. Is that the name of it? Fry, yeah. yeah. Fry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, the times change. Well, thank you very much for coming and, um, you know, I've been to uh, several awful houses including on my honeymoon that was our first dinner <laughs> <laughs> first breakfast um, but it they uh, to answer your question and my observations is that they didn't have it, it's not like they're doing yahoo out in the hot in the parking lot there it's like a denny's or any other place like uh like that where the people go inside and they have their uh, meals and they're not waiting in a line to go through the takeout so that's a plus i think I'm assuming there's also going to be so much foot traffic right by those houses to get to the Waffle House, so I think there will there's going to be a lot of commotion, I imagine. I mean, that's part of the reason for the fencing. I made sure people didn't cut across through there, which was yeah. And I'd we assume... Have to go around the yeah. cemetery. And I'd assume for, you know, for student traffic, they're going to be coming for, like, and a late-night crowd. Hopefully, if it's a late night crowd, they're not coming in cars, but okay, they'll be walking down High Street anyways, I would assume. I'm sure they'll have their guests in Or an Uber. Drink responsibly. And that in the big picture sense, Uber. I mean, this isn't, this is kind of an auto-oriented thing, but they picked as close a lot as you could get to the mile square without being in the mile square. So I think, I'm hoping this will generate foot traffic. You know, it's close yeah. enough on the College Corner Pike that that if people walk out here and I think again for it's hard to fit in these suburban things that have to have lots of parking close enough to actually be walkable but given the limited number of the sites this is as good it's a good place for that yeah. you know um, yeah. I hope people walk here instead of all driving uh, this or, at least or the, riding the yeah. I appreciate that you included bicycle parking <laughs> all right thank you any other comments or questions Now, I believe we can move to second reading. Okay. An ordinance changing the names of future private streets in the Owls Landing subdivision and directing the Clerk of Council to forward a certified copy of this ordinance to the county engineer. Okay. I, just in terms of procedure, Mr. Kennard, um, we received a request to table this so that they can reconsider their names. Um, do we need to have the motion in second or should we have the tabling first? Actually, it was withdrawn. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, if it's withdrawn. Then that makes it simpler? That makes it real simple. Okay, done. <laughs> Read number two. <laughs> An ordinance approving the final subdivision application and plat for Owls Landing Block B, being a replat of lot 4119 within Owls Landing Block A with conditions. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt this ordinance? So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Sam? There was one change. Uh, we added an additional condition somewhat related to the withdrawn ordinance which is to uh, make sure that the street names are ones that you all have approved. Uh, so we are vetting some new names. We're not ready to reveal those yet because they haven't been fully vetted. But um, if this is approved tonight, then it won't be recorded until those new names are approved. So. Okay. I did get communication from a number of people who indicated they were relieved <laughs> that that change had not been made. So we'll see how that turns out. Um, is there any, 
anyone from Owls Landing Development who wants to speak to this? I don't see anyone. Um, is there anyone from the public who would like to address this ordinance? Seeing none, councilors? Yeah, I have a question for you, sir. Yes, sir. When you said you had individuals that were relieved about this current ordinance that is being withdrawn and the changes within. Yes. Did they imply they liked the bird names? They did. Okay. I was just yeah. curious. Yeah. They, they did. They liked them. N not so much screech, <laughs> but, but the other. I mean, it's Owl's Landing, so they wanted owl-related names. Even Owl's Landing Drive would be fine. But yeah. Screech, they weren't too hot on it's a popular character. I, I know, that's the music. I live on Screech Lane. Yeah. <laughs> okay. His life is tragic. Could have been yeah. Screech Alley. Screech. All right. Uh, is there further discussion? Are you ready to vote? You may call the roll. Mr. Pretherch? Yes. Ms. Ragu? Yes. Mr. Bracken? Yes. Mr. Ellerby? Yes. Ms. Franklin? Yes. Ms. French? Yes. Mayor Snapley. Yes. The ordinance is adopted. We move to number three. An ordinance approving the second six-month extension of the final approved subdivision plat for South Forest Edge Section 1. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt this ordinance? So moved. Second. And it's seconded. Thank you very much. Sam? Any no no changes, changes. from last time? No, thank you. Okay. Is there anyone from... The petitioner who wants to address this? Not seeing them. Um, we'll move to the public. Anyone from the public wish to address this ordinance? Okay, anyone from council wishing to address this ordinance? Call the roll. Ms. Ragu? Yes. Mr. Bracken? Yes. Mr. Ellerby? Yes. Ms. Franklin? Yes. Ms. French? Yes. Mr. Petherch? Yes. Mayor Snavely? Yes. This ordinance is adopted and we'll move to number four. An ordinance approving the second six-month extension of the final or approved final subdivision plat for South Forest Edge, Section 2. Okay. Is there a motion? I move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. Any changes, Sam? No changes. Thank you. Okay. And uh, the petitioner is not here. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this ordinance? Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from council? I think we talked it out last time. Okay, you may call the roll. Mr. Bracken? Yes. Mr. Ellerby? Yes. Yes. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, it's a long day. I'm sorry. I'm voting for all of you. I'm just going to start voting for all of you. Uh, Dave Ms. will speak for all of you. Uh, yeah. Ms. Franklin? <laughs> yes. Ms. French? Yes. Mr. Prathurch? Glenn can vote for me now. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Ragu? Yes. Mayor Snavely? Yes. The ordinance is adopted, and we will move to announcements and communications, and I recognize City Manager Elliot. Thank you. I just have one little item that I want to share with the council and the public. So we've been notified that our annual comprehensive financial report uh, for fiscal year 2021 has been awarded the GFOA Certificate of Achievements for Excellence in Financial Reporting. So this report has been judged by an impartial panel to meet the high standards of the program, which includes demonstrating a constructive spirit of full disclosure, to clearly communicate its financial story and motivate potential users and user groups to read the report. And so this is a, quite an accomplishment. It's our 38th year to receive this award, so I congratulate our Director of Finance, Joe Newland, and his staff for this accomplishment. As I've said before, not every city goes through this, and uh, it does take a lot of additional work, but it's a it's a it's quite an accomplishment for the city. And uh, once again, it's our 38th year, so we've been doing it for quite a while. It's a very important report. I know when I want to look up things from other cities, I look for their reports, and sometimes all they do is just what's required by the state rather than this comprehensive financial report. So as I put in my report to council, you can find this report in last year's on our, on our website. So that's all I have this evening, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Okay, Chief. Just a couple quick announcements tonight. Um, 
As a student of law enforcement, uh, Sir Robert Peel said, and he's regarded as the father of modern, modern police, and if you're not aware of him, he said in part, the police are the public and the public are the police. Uh, over the past several weeks, we've taken uh, a number of reports. They've involved thefts from businesses, uh, damage to personal property, and we've had some assaults on members of the public. Uh, many of these cases have been solved with much assistance from our local citizens. We often take time in our division to give commendations and awards to our division members and staff. But it's important to remember that without the willing and observant witnesses, many of our reported crimes would go unsolved. Uh, with that said, we'd just like to take a moment to commend our citizens and thank them for speaking up at a time when others do not. Uh, as the saying goes, if you see something, say something. Uh, with that, uh, Green Beer Day is coming up next Thursday. <laughs> So please, at 5 o'clock in the morning, if you see something, <laughs> say, say something. something. Uh, OPD and MPPD, Oxford Fire, we've all been meeting to talk about what we're going to be doing, our plans. Uh, some of them will be very uh, noticeable. Some of them will be uh, unnoticeable, like the undercovers that, uh, that we'll have in town from the state, as well as our investigations unit. Um, but we're just looking at all the extra needs we're going to need that day. And remind everyone to exercise caution during the daytime as we witness what all of us see at late night Oxford come to our morning commute and afternoon commute from home and uh, from work and, and school. Uh, and then lastly, a quick update on Chief Jones. He's in his ninth week at the FBI National Academy and wrapping up his final assignments. His academic work during the week is focused on leadership, crisis management, and officer wellness. Uh, he's spending his weekends as any good student of history would in the DC area. And he's taken in many uh, historic landmarks, sending lots of pictures, and getting to uh, sightsee quite a bit during his personal off time. Uh, he's in good spirits, anxious to get back to Oxford. So as he said in the most recent email, throw our daily routines that we've gotten accustomed to out of whack. So with that, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Joe, do you have anything tonight? Okay, Chief. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Sam. Okay. Jessica. Thank you. Good evening. Just a few updates tonight. Um, wanted to provide you an update that we have been working for a few months now on a tobacco retail licensing program together with the Butler County General Health District. So a special thank you to Sam and Jeff for helping and Chris um, for helping me comb through it line by line. Because it's like way more complicated than you think it would be. Uh, this ordinance will incorporate both a retail licensing provision and a density provision to try to, you know, not prohibit these um, re tobacco retailers, but decide how many we have and where they are in town. And so a final review has been sent to the Butler County General Health District, and with their approval, we hope to bring that to you in April. So I just wanted to kind of give you a, a status update on that project. And is it the case that there are other communities kind of waiting to see what we do? I believe Fairfield has been watching kind of what we're doing, and Hamilton already has one, Kent already has one, Reynoldsburg and a few other cities already have them. Um, and then um, Doug and I spoke that we may explore a similar ordinance specific to marijuana retail and density. Um, I tried in the last minute to like maybe put it in with this one and that it just didn't make sense to lump it together. So we might explore a separate one for a similar goal to restrict where they are and how many and that type of thing. Okay. So stay tuned. And then I also want to let you know that I attended the county commissioner's meeting yesterday morning um, where they did um, have an update from um, um, County Administrator Judy Boyko on their ARPA spending and then she did ask for guidance on our two proposals and then um, they did then hear public comment and quite a few people from our uh, community did attend and make comments. They did make no indication verbally at that time but I would imagine that over the next several meetings we'll start to see something emerge from that, those public comments and so we'll just be watching the agendas to see when that resolution might come forward. So we'll keep you posted when we learn more and I believe that is all tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Heather? Nothing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll follow up on Jessica's comments about the tobacco ordinance. Uh, Oxford is not going it alone. Um, we are certainly on the forefront of the movement to uh, pass ordinances like this. Uh, 
but I think it's important, and you'll see this in the whereas clauses, the data is showing that, that the availability of vape products, et cetera, and I can attest to this firsthand as the uh, former father of three teenagers, now I'm down to two, um, that, that there's a group of teenagers that they just don't see the danger in the products. And uh, with the, the proliferation of vape products in this community, I think it's a testament to ex exactly how appealing and how the marketing is impacting youth. And um, and so anyway, I want to be very clear about that, that, that this is a trend that is going across the state and the country. And indeed, we even managed to get the governor to veto a bill that would have pro prohibited our efforts to uh, restrict and control this product. Okay, thank you very much. Glenn? Nothing, thank you. I have two things. So uh, I wanted to touch base. We received a constituent email earlier today asking if council was aware of what was happening with Tawanda School District. And I think since it's come up a couple of times this evening, um, council is in fact aware. And I wanted to, as the council liaison to the recreation board, address a specific question in that email, which was, does the Parks and Recreation Department know about this? Are they planning for contingencies? And the short answer to that is yes. Um, Parks and Rec is very aware that with sports being impacted by the lack of passing of the levy, that there may be an increased demand for Parks and Recreation sponsored sports teams. So everybody's in the know and is starting to think about what that impact might look like. And then my second item is as a Miami alumni, I think I would be remiss to not wish the students a happy Green Beer Day in advance, but also please be safe for if any students are listening to this, just be safe out there. Thank you. To follow up on what Jessica and Chris had said, that um, I spent quite a bit of time looking up incidents of cancer from county to county, and there's certainly some counties that have a much higher uh, percentage than we do, so fortunately for that, a lot of that due to pollution and that kind of thing, but the number one cause of late-term diagnosis of cancer is lung cancer across the board, county to county. So whenever people think about fate products, it's important to know that it's such a new product and we don't know what the complications will be. So it definitely is a public health problem. And I know that I'm sure whenever we're looking at the tobacco licensing, we're probably also gonna be looking at equity, right? That the neighborhoods that are already experiencing poverty and blight and a higher proportion of substance use problems are not the ones that will further be saddled with these establishments disproportionately. Okay, thank you. Nothing tonight. Okay. I wanted to address uh, <clears throat> the, the failing of the school levy and the cuts that are, are doing real harm. And I hope we do our best to mitigate those harms. But one of the things I've mentioned before that I'm concerned about is that if we end up adding on additional tax levies to address our fire and EMS, I think it'll hurt the odds of passing the school levy going forward which would make these cuts more permanent and even worse, it's gonna get worse with time because even under those cuts, it doesn't solve the issue long term. No, and so that's more. more, yeah, it'll just keep getting worse. So we basically need a levy. I hope we mitigate everything in between there, but we're gonna need a levy to address that. Um, and I think if we have other levies being put forth for stuff like Byron AMS, it will hurt the odds of that passing and I don't wanna see that. So I hope we focus on a solution there um, and work with Miami to get there. Okay, thank you. So um, pick up on what Councilor French was saying. Uh, so we do have a parking and transportation advisory board and we've had conversations about how engaged we should be. But you know, our, our current chair, Carla Blackmore, is looking ahead and saying, we're gonna see some serious transportation pattern changes in the next, in the upcoming months around. If there's no more busing, <laughs> the amount of traffic volume that we're gonna see around our schools, the pressure to walk and bike. Um, and so it's, uh, there's limits to what the city can take on of things that are ultimately Talawanda's uh, responsibility. But things like safe routes to school, which we did about 10 years ago, we've made some good progress with that. Um, we, we might have to dust off some of those plans to identify like, you know, if we're going to have a lot more kids walking to school, what are those pinch points and those danger points that are city controlled? That can we do anything about to make it better? You know, signal timing or something. Uh, so I think uh, I, 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 and I anticipate that the police department is going to have to work. And this is why having something because it's a 
it's an interdisciplinary problem. It's going to be policing. I mean, it's going to be traffic stacking up around schools. It's going to be kids walking to school. I think it's going to be a little messy in August. Um, and I hope that the city can do what it can to support the school district. We can't take on more than we can take on, but within our means, it'd be nice. Um, so little thing, we did get a constituent email, and this is something about the Monarchs, Mayor's Monarch Pledge, which um, we, we have these council goals and, and we could say, well, that's not on the list, we can't do it this year. I was looking into it and basically all these other things we're doing qualify us for the pledge. So basically what's required is the mayor to sign on behalf of the council. The checklist of things we're supposed to do are things we're already doing. Pilot gardens, the naturalization master plan, thinking about some kind of ordinance change. Like we, we're satisfying the substance of it. There's some reporting at the end of it. I don't know how involved it is. I, I don't anticipate it's involved, but we would have to look to see like if there's reporting, who does it. So I guess the question is, is with something like this, do we say full up, no, or if this is a, a, a small symbolic thing for something we're already doing, is there council support to just maybe at least look into like how much reporting is there? Is this gonna add extra staff time or not? And so I just, before that email, things emails that are like three days old, they're already in the past and received. I can't, you know, I'm so busy now. I just I've, wanted I've to catch a, a sentiment of the room mm -hmm. about whether this was worth exploring further and if it was really no additional significant cost to us, whether we wanted to do it for symbolic reasons right. uh, or whether we just want to be like, not this year. I've, I've gotten several of those. They're basically the same letter uh, from different people and I appreciate it and um, my intention is when things calm down a little bit to look into it in more detail and then maybe we can have a work session or something to discuss it uh, so that everybody knows what's involved. But my inclination is to support it. Yeah, and I guess I would say, I, if, if it depends on, we have limited bandwidth, but having looked into it, it's literally, we can check the boxes already. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think we want to defer to, on this staff on this one. And yeah, I don't want to take up a lot of response. staff. Yeah, I don't want to put it but, it, but if it were a minor thing that's you get, you sign and then we do a, a Google form at the end of the year, and, and there's some recognition, and Hamilton did it, Yellow Springs did it. Um, like I say, it's not on the list for this year, but if, if we don't talk about it now, I'll forget about it. About right. It. So that's all, I, you know, just wanna raise that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you raising it. I'm inclined to support it. I'm, I'm reacting positively to it. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to comment on, uh, two things. One is <coughs> the license, <coughs> excuse me, the licensing issue, um, and something that uh, Chantel mentioned, there is some research that is indicating that it is not only as bad, but maybe worse than tobacco. So it's not just that we don't know that it's dangerous, we know that it's dangerous. And um, I think that this is an opportunity for us to support the Coalition for a Healthy Community in the Oxford area, who is behind this 100%, and um, so I hope we move forward with it. Uh, the second thing is that on April 22nd, one of the top events of the Oxford community will be taking place, and that is Kiwanis Pancake Day. Now, this is bigger than the chili supper. I mean, everybody shows up for the pancake dinner, so I want you all to put that on the pancake breakfast. It goes really till lunchtime. You could have lunch, brunch. It's a lot of options there. Uh, it's pretty much all you can eat. So I hope that, you, hey, the funds that are raised by this go to support the children in our community. And so I hope that everyone will support it. Put it on your calendars and see me or Chantel or Mike Rudolph or some other member of Kiwanis and we will hook you up with tickets. I expect that everyone here will buy tickets from me so that I will have them all sold. <laughs> All right. Did I do okay, Mike? All right. Yep. I always support Kiwanis. So uh, with all that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. It's moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you very much.